Today, there's good news for people with inflammatory bowel disease or a poorly functioning J pouch, cock pouch, or ileostomy. You owe it to yourself to learn more about the comfort, convenience, and confidence of appliance free living. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Kay, and I am the director of the BCIR program. And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I uh, represent a program in Palms Pasadena Hospital, which is in St. Pete, Florida. And uh, we're here today to talk about an option for people who have inflammatory bowel disease or individuals that have had that as a history and have had surgical intervention. Um, it's, an, it's an ostomy, but it's an internal reservoir where you don't have to wear an appliance. Uh, it's called the Barnett Continent Intestinal Reservoir. And try saying that a thousand times. It's not easy. So for short, we just use the alphabet and we'd say BCIR, Barnett Continent Intestinal Reservoir. Um, we have a presentation today broken up in three different segments. Uh, the first segment will be a patient talking, and her name is Velma Bragg. Uh, Velma will be coming up in a second. Just want to tell you a little bit about Velma. Uh, Velma was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis many, many, many years ago. Please don't sit there with a calculator and try to figure out her age because we are personal friends and she will be upset with me. Um, <laughs> but she had an ileostomy for 10 years. She is an ET nurse um, and now they refer to that individual as a wound ostomy continent nurse. But she had ulcerative colitis, she had an ileostomy, and then as a profession, she was taking care of individuals with ostomies, colostomies, ileostomies, anybody with a stoma. She was thriving with the uh, ileostomy, but just was not um, content. And she uh, had an opportunity to uh, see some advertisement about the BCIR and was very, very interested. So she has had a BCIR since the 80s. Uh, she is what I refer to very uh, jokingly as the initial experiment. Uh, because there wasn't a lot of data and there wasn't a lot of support for continent pouches. Uh, she's done very, very well and has taught me everything I know and has been a mentor to myself as well as a mentor to many, many patients. So she is going to be doing the technical aspect of the program. I am going to be doing the second segment and I'm going to be bragging about the hospital because I am very proud of our program. And then the third segment will be questions and answers. Okay, you're here for a seminar, so Velma Braggs is going to be the first speaker. Again, she's here from a personal basis as well as a professional basis. So it's all yours, Velma. We are here to talk about the Barnett Continent Intestinal Reservoir, as, or as Susan said, the BCIR. Uh, and if you're having to have uh, your colon and rectum removed, there's a big word that is used to describe that called proctocolectomy. The procto refers to the rectal area, col re refers to the colon, and ectomy just simply means the removal of. It can be whatever precedes that, like tonsillectomy, uh, uh, cholecystectomy, anything that's got ectomy on the end of it just means that, that whatever precedes it has been removed. So if you, there are some indications then that we're all familiar with for having to have a proctocolectomy. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, familial polyposis, and some of the other things could be uh, uh, cancer or accidents or uh, birth defects, just to, name, just to name some incidental things that, what, that could cause you to have your colon and rectum removed. Uh, the conventional or Brooke ileostomy is the one that most of us are familiar with and that is the, was the gold standard for many years by which all other ostomies were measured. Uh, and then the ileal J pouch or the intestinal reservoir. And I think that it behooves the individual now because we have so much information available to us, like some of you said, you know, you looked at the internet and found out about the procedure. And that's one of the first questions that we're always asked, why didn't we know about it? And I've been doing these uh, seminars for a long, long time. I did them with Dr. With Dr. Um, Barnett, with Dr. Pollock, and now with Dr. Rinky. And we've been all over the United States doing them. But everywhere we go, it's still the same thing, that nobody knows about it. You know, why didn't we know about it? 
But I think that nowadays, <clears throat> if you're facing with have, having to have ostomy surgery, I think that the individual, the physician, the surgeon, and maybe your ET nurse or your WCN nurse should sit down and explore all three options. In the past, we didn't have any options. We just had the one, the conventional ileostomy. But now we have three options, and I think it's, it's important that we look at all three and decide which one best suits that individual's lifestyle. Because as you know, what will work for one may not work for the other. I wish I could stand here and tell you that one of these is perfect. And that's what everybody should go out and get. But that's not right because it's not perfect for everybody. And I think that everybody needs to decide and have a voice in what happens to them. Um, but it's, it's sort of a, a trend toward continence now. So I think that individuals are looking for more procedures and more ways that they can enjoy their life with a continent procedure. <clears throat> but the, the brook ileostomy, as most of you know, had, you have no control over it. The end of the small intestine called the ileum surfaces through the abdominal wall forming a projecting spout. And we as ET nurses like to see that spout about two centimeters in length because the individual is going to have to fa uh, place a face plate or a pouch, a collecting device for that individual's um, discharge or their body waste to collect in. And so we like for it to protrude because that digestive enzymes is still in that small intestine. So if that leaks out on your skin, you know, it really irritates and burns and eats the skin up. Uh, so if you've got, if you've got a, a, a stoma that that's protrudes, that's away from any bony prominences, that's on a flat plane of the abdomen, then you, ha you stand a better chance of having a successful uh, wear of that. And normally you can wear it for a week to 10 days, but not many people can do that or not everybody can do that because sometimes when we as ET nurses or WCNs go in and mark the, the site for the stoma, keeping it in the abdominal rectus muscle and uh, looking at the abdomen, when that patient gets on the operating room table, that surgeon, he may see a whole different way that he can't necessarily bring that stoma out to the place that we had designated it to be because there are a lot of different things that go on. So, but we try, to, we try to put it in a place where it'll be easy to contain, easy to work with, and where the patient can see it and can change it and wear it. But as, <clears throat> but as you know, there is no control, and as it comes out, stool and or gas, it empties into your collecting device or your pouch, your external pouch. The ileal anal J pouch, there's a lot of different terms for some of these operations. And it's usually the locale or wherever it was, or even the physician like Dr. Barnett, that uh, how they get their name. Uh, but this, this procedure can either be done as a single procedure or a two-stage two procedure, or in some instances, three. Uh, <clears throat> the small intestine, the pouch is made out of the small intestine. The patient's uh, colon is, is removed but the anal sphincter muscles are left intact at the very bottom. And this is your control mechanism. Uh, the, the reason it's done in two, two surgeries, they first go in, remove the diseased colon, create a temporary ileostomy up high, and that ileostomy is, is functional for three to four months, giving this area in the very bottom where that little pouch is made time to heal. Okay, there's a lot of the pouch is very small and there's a lot of sutures and staples in this pouch. And um, a lot of people get by with this and then after about three or four months they go back in uh, and just open the abdomen, drop this uh, stool back, I mean this, this bowel back into the abdomen and then the patient sits on the commode in the normal way and defecates through their anal opening. And many colorectal surgeons now are trying to call this the gold standard. Um, but, but a lot of patients do well with this procedure. A lot do not. Um, remember the, the enzymes that's in the small intestine, like what would irritate your skin around the stoma if you had a, a pouch leakage, 
those same enzymes are still in there as it comes out down here. So I, it's what we as ET nurses lovingly call sometimes, these patients get butt burn and the, from a number of bowel movements a day. And some patients report as many as 14 to 18 bowel movements a day. And you know if that much is passing through there, you're gonna get skin irritation. There's no way not to. Uh, there's a, sometimes these patients have nighttime incontinence uh, because especially if this, if this sphincter muscle here has been stretched uh, during surgery, that sphincter may have, have been damaged. And so you may not have control over that. Or if you had ulcerative colitis for so long and you may have damaged your sphincter muscle, it may not be as tight. You, if you have incontinence with ulcerative colitis, then you're gonna have incontinence with a J pouch. And so a lot of patients do not like this because of the number of stools they have. But there are patients who, after several months, they get regulated and they have three to four to six bowel movements a day, and they're happy with that. But most of them that do that, they have to take uh, something like coating or emodium or something like that to keep their stools uh, from having so many stools a day. But that is an option for someone who has never had any surgery. If you've already had, if you have a brucheliostomy and your uh, rectum has been removed and closed off, then you do not have a choice of this. But if you've never had any surgery, you have three choices, okay? <clears throat> the next one then is the intestinal reservoir. And this too is a surgically created pouch made from the small intestine. A little of the history about that, Dr. Niels Koch in the late 60s uh, created, um, was the first physician, he was from Sweden, that created this internal reservoir uh, uh, concept, but he had a high failure rate. Uh, it was about a 40% or higher failure rate. And so a lot of the institutions across the country sort of abandoned that because they were putting the patient through this sophisticated long surgery and then it didn't work. Um, so a lot of them just quit doing it. Uh, but Dr. Barnett and some others across the country took Dr. Koch's concept and made it a viable option. Uh, looked at his uh, uh, complications and tried to correct them and, uh, and make it uh, more of a viable option for all of us. Uh, but Dr. Barnett's first five cases were of the Coke pouch, Coke variety, and he too had that high failure rate, and he too was going to abandon it. But some of his patients, one in particular, really talked, talked to him hard and told him that, that he could do it. And, and she said, you just need to go back and look at, at what happened to these patients, what, what went wrong, you can figure it out. And he did. He was like watching, a, I don't know, how do you, an engineer, I guess. He used to tell us that he would get up at four o'clock in the morning and um, start thinking about these surgeries and what he could do to make it better, especially if he had had a complication and he would get on a legal pad and he would just draw out the diagram of these pouches and how he could loop the bowel back around and all of that to make it a better, a better option for us. This is Dr. Barnett and unfortunately he passed away in uh, 1995 and ironically he ended up with a neobladder which is he had cancer of the bladder and had to have his, um, his bladder removed. And so they created him a pouch made from the small intestine and connected it up to the top of his urethra. So, but isn't it ironic that he spent so, much, so many years of his life talking about internal reservoirs and he ended up with one too. But we, uh, <clears throat> we lost a great person in medicine and surgery when he did pass away, but thank God he left his legacy by teaching Dr. Rinke and others. Uh, his concept, and he wanted to spread the word. He wanted people to, his operating room was open to anybody who wanted to come in and, and, um, and look at it and, and uh, learn how to, how to do the surgery. <clears throat> so the rest of our presentation, we're really gonna concentrate more on the BCIR, the Barnett version of the Coke pouch. 
then the indications for a continent reservoir is if that patient has a brucheliostomy and they're dissatisfied with it for whatever the reasons, they may be having a lot of skin irritation, they may be can't keep the pouch on, uh, they may be looking at hernia surgery, and if they're going to have to go back in their abdomen, then they want to look for something that will give them a continence. So at, while they're having to open the abdomen, then they choose to go ahead and convert to the uh, Barnett procedure. If they had a Coke, Coke pouch, and if it failed, or if they had a J pouch, an ileoanal pouch, and it failed, and if it's like I said earlier, the patient had ulcerative colitis for a long time with poor sphincter control, then they wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for the IPPA or the J pouch because of that factor of, uh, of the incontinence and that sphincter muscle not holding. Um, just to describe the, the revisions that Dr. Barnett made uh, on his own, on his own um, procedure, there were three major things. Uh, one was the collar of the valve. And the, another one was the, um, the, the design of the valve. He changed the design of the valve. But I'm just going to go into that a little bit now and the direction of the peristalsis to make the valve. This, this valve is made by intersuscepting bowel on bowel, like you push your sleeve up on itself and it kind of locks it in there. That's how they first came about with this, with this concept. Well, Dr. Koch, his came from the end of the, of the bowel, which would make it an anti-peristaltic valve. Oh, this is going to be a test after this. <laughs> and, and, but Dr. Barnett changed the direction of the valve. Just remember that he changed the direction of the valve to an isoperistaltic valve, which meant that he came above the pouch and took a portion of the, of the intestine in a forward direction to make the valve. So that if the valve did slip, it would go into the pouch and not necessarily come out making a, a, an S configuration. When the valve slips, the patient has a difficulty getting the catheter in because they can't guide it through that, those curves. And that's an indication that you may have a slipped valve if that happens. Um, also, the pouches were round in configuration, but where you had these three big flaps of, of uh, tissue coming together and all of these sutures in there and staples in there, right at this little trifurcation area, sometimes that would not get adequate blood supply. And so when something doesn't get adequate blood supply, what happens? That tissue dies. It has a heart attack. And <clears throat> so that would cause that uh, tissue to kind of erode in there and it would be a leak and that's that leak is called a fistula. It's just, it can be no bigger than a pinhole, but it will go until it finds a way out and that's usually at the weakest point in the abdomen, either the abdomen or through the stoma, the abdominal incision. You would be leaking uh, stool with that fistula. So he, he decided to do something about this collar and he added the collar because Dr. Koch had no collar. So he added this synthetic fabric called Marlex that is supposedly tissue friendly that's used in surgery for a lot of different reasons. And he said he thought by it being tissue friendly that it wouldn't he wouldn't have any problems with it. But over the years he did. It would erode through uh, the, the tissue in the valve and they would get a, a valve fistula from, from that Marlex. But there are some patients today who still have their Marlex, uh, Marlex collar. You said you don't, do you, Betty? I don't either, but, um, but there are some who do uh, still have that Marlex collar and never had a problem with it. So he decided rather than using that, if he, if he took the part at the end of the uh, intestine that Dr. Cope used to intersuscept down to make that nipple valve, if he took that and left it in concert with the pouch and let it wrap around and buttress the base of that valve, then it would be the patient's own tissue. So there's nothing now that's not of the patient's own tissue. And when the, when the tension or the 
pressure inside the pouch rises either from stool and or gas, it will actually reflux up into that, up into that collar like a purse string and it'll tighten it. And then when you intubate, which is the process of emptying the pouch, which we'll talk about, then when that catheter goes down through the stoma, that uh, is released. And so it's just a constant back and forth with that purse string. And it, it's not enough to cause any pressure, like a pressure ulcer or something on it, because it's constantly releasing. The other thing is he, des he changed the design of this pouch. You can see this, this one over here originally was like a baseball. So he decided to do away with this trification here and have one line down the center of the pouch more in a football kind of configuration. And so that would, this by doing this, he relieved, he uh, didn't completely, because I don't think you'll ever be completely without some complication because we're dealing with, with human tissue and you know nothing is ever 100% perfect and anything can happen. But they have reduced the, the complication rates for valve fistula and pouch uh, fistula significantly by these three improvements. This is the actual pouch now, and it's called the BCIR4, and probably it's not going to be any more improvements in it. I think they've, they've uh, improved it about as far as they can go unless, you know, when they're in the operating room doing it, they, they probably see something that they want to change a little bit, and they probably do it. I don't know. I haven't been in there with Dr. Rinky, but, but, but I've, seen, I've been with a lot of surgeons, and I know how they how they do things. So I'm sure they've, they've made some, uh, their, some of their own little revisions as they've gone along the way. Um, but just to go over, this is the skin. This is the stoma, the part that's brought to the outside. The access segment off that valve, this is the valve itself. This is the intestinal collars that wraps around it. And this is, uh, they now staple that valve to the wall of the pouch so that it has the same stability and every time you intubate, you go in in the same direction every time. Before, it just sort of dangled inside the pouch and sometimes it would be angled when you'd go to put your catheter in and so you couldn't actually follow through so well. You'd have to sometimes put your pinky in then pop it back over and then follow it with the catheter. But now it's the same direction all the time and that helped that. Uh, also, another thing that they did in the four was they added the serosal patch. Okay, mucosa is the inside lining of the bowel. Serosa is the outside of the bowel. Okay, so by rather, you know, that long suture line that was straight up and down, by the, the uh, ileum emptying into the bottom of that pouch, if you remember that slide, they decided that if they would bring this uh, loop of bowel up and splice it over that suture line, and this is going to connect to that collar, then that entire suture line will be covered by the bowel. So if it did fistulize, it would fistulize right back into the intestine, and so the patient wouldn't have any symptoms. So the summary then of these Advanced advancements, and Dr. Barnett often told me that these were probably the greatest three advancements in continent surgery. And one was they reversed the direction of that valve to reduce slippage. They developed an intestinal collar to enhance the continence and changed the design of the pouch uh, to reduce the fistula complication. And this is a, a, a picture of a created uh, actual created pouch, and as you can see, these, these connect right here, and that's, this is the opening, if you can see that, that empties the small intestine into the pouch, and then this is the tip of the valve right there. Okay, and it lies transversely across your abdomen, and it's a non-protruding stoma because you don't have to have a protruding stoma because you're not going to put a, a a pouch on the outside to collect it in. All you're going to have to do is just wear some little absorptive dressing because um, the uh, 
bowel is constantly producing mucus. And so it's the kind of mucus, if you have a stoma now and you see the shiny liquid, or, or if you eat something spicy or hot and then your nose runs, it's going to always be mucus. So you have to have something to collect that mucus, so a little small Band-Aid or whatever dressing that you decide to use for that. There's a multitude of things that people use. And this is the way it actually looks in surgery. I know y'all all that don't have one would like to run out today and get this done. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I think everybody should because <laughs> it's a much easier way and you have control, right? <laughs> and you, you don't have to, you know, your husband may have to jump up in the middle of a movie or church service and run out, but you don't have to do that. You can wait. Uh, and, of course, this is the way it looks post-op, immediate post-op. This is uh, big surgery. Um, and you remember when your abdomen looked like that, Fred? <laughs> uh, this is your long suture line right down the middle. This is a, a catheter that's placed in the stomach. It's called a gastrostomy at the time you're in surgery. And we're going to talk about that again in a minute. This patient was a takedown from a brucheliostomy, and this is where that stoma was right here. This is the catheter that's placed in the pouch at the time of surgery. And this is the new stoma. You can see how low on the abdomen that this is, because this is the pubic hairline way down here. This is just a drain that's put in the following surgery. Um, so you don't have to really look for, you can have this stoma, this stoma put wherever you want to, so it's not going to interfere with any kind of clothing or bathing suits or anything like that like that, that you want to wear because it's, it's going to be low on your abdomen. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of men, when they have um, an ileostomy done, a brook ileostomy done, you know, you look and you try to find a plane on the, uh, a flat plane on the abdomen, but a lot of these guys wear their pants so low, you know, that you don't have room below the belt to find a, a place to put that stoma. So it has to come above the belt. And that's the nuisance in clothing because, you know, it's going to bulge or whatever if it's above, above the belt line. Uh, another picture and a little anatomy of the BCR4 again. Um, this is the skin the stoma, the catheter going in, and this is the tip of the valve right there, if you can see that, and then this is the tip of the catheter. And once it goes through, it will drain out by gravity into the commode or whatever you're draining into. The small intestine as it empties into the pouch. A little bit more about the collar. You can see here where the, the pouch is very relatively empty, and so the collar is relaxed. And then as the tension rises, it squeezes it, and so it's tight again. And so it's a constant back and forth, you know, motion with, with that going and coming. Because you know the ileum is constantly producing. It's never without anything in it. You know, it's always moving. It's always something. <clears throat> The advantages then of the st VCR stoma, well, some of these we've already said, it's small, it's like a little buttonhole, and again, uh, no abdominal wall projecting spout, located lower, and it may be, to close, may be close to uh, bony prominences or skin folds as well, because you know, all you're gonna have to do is just put a little dressing over it to contain the mucus. Nothing's gonna come through it until you put the catheter in except mucus. And it looks exactly like something like that, like a little buttonhole in the lower abdomen. Intubation, we've skirted around that a little bit, is the process of draining the pouch. And right at first, you, um, the patient may be a little bit intimidated because you're invading your body with something that you're not used to doing. And I learned at the last um, meeting, it was a guy there that they had to have two nurses go in and help because he passed out. <laughs> wimpy guys. <laughs> but, the, but normally a nurse will go in the bathroom with you and the first time you intubate, it's like old school then. It's nothing to it. You'll see there's no pain involved because there are no nerve endings in the bowel. So you may feel, because you're looking at it, you may feel a little tightness around the skin there. And when the stone was first created, it's pretty large, you know. 
but it's going to shrink down just like the, the other stoma that you had, the, if you had another stoma. It'll shrink down. And then once you have emptied it, then you, the, cap, the uh, stool or gas drains out by gravity, but I would advise you to have that catheter directed toward the toilet <laughs> because it will have uh, some pressure behind it because remember gas hasn't come through it. Nothing has come through it, you know, until you insert that catheter. And sometimes it's kind of an explosive sound, and it could redecorate your bathroom in a lovely <laughs> shade of brown. <laughs> You're all laughing because you, you know it's happened to most of us, hasn't it? <laughs> but I, I'll tell you a little secret that I do with that is that I fan fold some toilet tissue in the bottom of the commode. Well, if you, use, if you sit on the commode and intubate, and intubate, I've learned in doing these seminars that people go to the bathroom in a lot of different ways. <laughs> because some, you know, uh, kneel and some uh, stand and some lie down. And so it's, it's different ways that people go to the bathroom, but that's your business, you know, whatever works best for you. Uh, <clears throat> but normal intubation is that that the pouch itself will retain this fluid for or this affluent for several hours until you decide that you want to go to the bathroom. You know, you're given back your control again on your life. Your, your freedom has come back. Uh, in the early days, you want to avoid overfilling the pouch um, because, as I said earlier, it's very small. It's about the size of a lemon and it's got a gazillion uh, staples and sutures in it. And so you don't want any pressure on those suture lines. So that's why your catheter stays in as long as it does. But you don't want to overfill it. And then when that catheter comes out, you, you know, but Sue's going to go over this a little later, but you, you, know, you have a gradual increase in how many times you empty the pouch. And, but what you're doing is you're allowing your pouch to grow, to expand, and I encourage you all to do that because once it matures, then you don't have to go to the bathroom as much, you know, as often because, you know, we've spent most of our lives in the bathroom, the ones of us who had UC or Crohn's for a long, long time. And so you want to do something that can get you in and out quickly. I can do it. I can intubate during a commercial and be through with it. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to sit in the bathroom the rest of my life. Uh, but the frequency is usually two to four times a day. But rarely do you have to get up during the night and intubate unless you've got gastroenteritis or if you've eaten very late and you may have a lot of gas or you've eaten something spicy uh, like that, you may have to get up during the night and intubate. But very rarely do, do you have to. And, and I think it's, everybody will set up their own schedule, whether they go two to four times a day. I normally, you know, would do it in the morning. And then if I was going to do something after lunch, you know, like do a presentation or do uh, go to a movie or go shopping or whatever, then I would intubate for my own convenience so that I didn't have to an hour later, you know, when it may be more inconvenient for me to get to a toilet to do that. So you'll learn, you know, and set up your own routine. You want to lubricate the catheter, especially in the early days. And um, the natural lubricant that we all have is mucus. And some of us have more mucus than others. If I didn't have a patch on, I would be standing in water right here because <laughs> I have I have a lot of mucus, but not everybody has that much. And uh, so you'll, you'll learn, though. And uh, or the other thing is you can use mineral oil or the KY-type lubricant or even just tap water. You know, this is not sterile. You know, we're dealing with feces, so you just want to be clean. You can't be sterile with this. I have a friend that t said that um, he was in a toilet and didn't have anything to to lubricate his catheter with, so he just spit on it. And uh, it was his own lubricant so <laughs> to, to lubricate it. And it really, I've had to do that before, and it, it works. You know, I did it after he said that. Um, 
and we ask that you irrigate your pouch relatively clear once in a 24-hour period. Now, does everybody do this? No. <laughs> but uh, we think that it may uh, keep you from having pouchitis. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but if you have pouch, we're going to talk about pouchitis in a minute, but if you, if you irrigate every day and you don't have pouchitis, then you continue to do that. If you irrigate every day and you have pouchitis, then stop it because you're not helping yourself any and you may be harming yourself some. This one's really stiff. But it's just simply, you would get just a couple of syringes. This is like 60 cc's, two ounces, full of just tap water. This is not sterile, remember. And you've got your catheter. You've got your catheter in your stoma. And then you would, in, you've got a cath tip, cath tip syringe is tapered so that it'll go into the, into the end of the, the catheter. And then you would just instill the, instill the water into the pouch, internal pouch, and then again have this directed when you remove this. And, and then you just do that a couple of times. And so what we think is that you may, you may be ridding the pouch of some residual that you didn't get out when you intubated, and that that could or could not cause some pouchitis. Now, I don't, we don't know if that's true or not, but that's what some people think to do. <clears throat> I used to irrigate mine religiously every day, <clears throat> and, uh, but now I just do it if it's real thick and it's not wanting to drain out as quickly and I want to get out of there, I'll just put a slug of water in there and be on my way, you know, because it will thin it down and you can empty it. Another way is to drink more grape juice or have a glass of wine. That's grape, isn't it? <laughs> Some form of grape. Uh, intubation resistant, if you, if you have a problem getting your catheter in, try a different body position. As I said, you know, some people go to the bathroom in different ways. If you are used to standing, you kneel or sit down or lie down, or you can just leave it alone and go back 20 or 30 minutes later and it will slide right in. It may be just the angle of your, of your valve that's causing the problem. I have a friend that she kneels. She even carries a kneeling pad with her and uh, when she's going, uh, going around. And so she kneels in front of the toilet to do this. And I said, Ann, doesn't people uh, look at you funny when you come out of the bathroom? And <laughs> you do, she says, oh, well, if I see somebody next to me, I just start gagging. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like her, doesn't it? <laughs> Or if you do have a problem getting your catheter in, you, your, your lining may be too dry in your, in your, of your valve, so you want to increase your lubrication because that does happen. It can be too dry. Or you can take that same syringe, and if, it, if you get to a point where it won't go any further, you don't want to push on it because you could do yourself some harm. But just put about 10 cc's of water in that syringe and you've got it to the point, it may be just a fold in there, or a little skin tag or something. So you, you've got it just to that point, and then when you put the water in, just the pressure from the tip of that water coming out of that catheter will open it up and you can pass it right on through after that, and that works very well. Uh, but you may want to keep a variety of catheters available if you, if you have this problem. Uh, and, and I would say to do that if you're, just had the surgery because you know you you might run into all kind of situations because you're not used to it yet uh, but you know as I said the 30 the 30 uh, uh, catheter is what we use because it's a large bore catheter because sometimes your stool is is toothpaste consistency you know it's pretty thick sometimes and so it's got to come through that that catheter uh, but if you can't get that catheter in, then go down to a 24 or a smaller catheter. But if you do, don't continue to use that small catheter because if you do, it's going to shrink. Your stomach's going to shrink down to that size and you're going to have a hard time getting that stool out of a 24 catheter because that catheter is for urinary diversions that have the same thing. And there's some catheters on the table in front of you. 
And then once you um, finish intubating, just wipe the skin off and put your dressing on there. This one, what this is, is the, one of the Ampatch dressings, and I think there's some of those on the tables too. It's got hypoallergenic tape and it's waterproof tape. And it's, um, he's got a new one now that's really absorptive. And he created these guy up in New Hampshire, especially for the uh, continent patient. And it's called Ampatch. But some people, their skin is still sensitive to even that. And so they will figure, figure out other things to use. And some people even get by with using just a regular Band-Aid. And, but, and a lot of the people will take um, a lady's uh, panty liner or a peri pad and cut it in squares and take the, the adhesive off the back stripping and let that adhere to the undergarment, the, the sticky side, and then the, the absorptive pad is right over the stoma. And so this way they have no, no tape on their skin. But whatever works best for you. <clears throat> Susan is going to come now and do the remainder of the presentation. Uh, when we first create the BCIR, and I say we, obviously I'm not the surgeon, but when Dr. Rinke creates the BCIR and you leave the operating room, it's very, very small. It's about the size of a fist. That holding tank is going to grow, but at first it's very, very small. It's going to fill up real quick. Mother Nature is going to create gas just from you having a bowel. And so that gas is going to be ricocheting inside the bowel and you're going to feel uncomfortable. We are going to have you empty your pouch frequently, therefore we can counteract you feeling uncomfortable to the tune of every two hours. Over the next ensuing weeks and months, this holding tank is going to be able to get larger and larger to the point once you have a mature pouch it can hold a gallon and people are only intubating one, uh, twice, two or three times a day. But at first we are going to be asking you to follow our schedule and our schedule is going to be two hours during the day the first week that you're home, three hours and each week thereafter you're going to be putting an extra hour, in, hour into it. As the BCIR gets larger, the gas is going to be in, inside here ricocheting and you're not going to be the wiser. That's the development of a more mature pouch. An obstruction is usually related to scar tissue. Anybody that's had abdominal pain can get uh, an obstruction. You've had a hysterectomy, you've had a colon resection. Anytime they're in the abdominal girth, abdominal gut, the doctors are meticulously touching your organs, but despite that, you can develop some scar tissue. So an obstruction is basically some scar tissue that is wrapping itself around the small bowel. The uh, body waste travels down the small bowel and actually dwells, stays in the BCIR. You insert a catheter to empty it. Well, with an obstruction, the, uh, the lumen is very, very small. So for hypothetical discussion, I'm going to say the typical lumen of a small bowel is the size of a garden hose. All of a sudden, it's going to come down to a big pen, so it's going to back up. Therefore, you're going to get abdominal pain. And eventually, nothing is going to be coming into the BCIR, and that's a bowel obstruction. What I do want to tell you is anybody that's had surgery can get a bowel obstruction. The incidence is no higher with a BCIR than with an ileostomy than with any type of abdominal surgery. But it is certainly something that can happen. Pouchitis, we really do not understand it despite it being one of the biggest uh, annoyances or nuisance for the BCIR. But I do want to tell you anybody with a continent pouch can get pouchitis. You have a J pouch, you have a Coke pouch, you have a BCIR, you can get pouchitis. Now people will call me and they'll say, Sue, I have that infection back in my pouch. And I quickly correct them because as a healthcare provider, when we hear infection, it's a negative connotation. And with pouchitis, it is not an infection. So what I mean by that is if we were to do a stool culture, there's going to be no bad organisms growing in your, bo your bowel. But it does respond to an antibiotic as if it is pouchitis. So we have to tell you we're really not sure what it is. What we can tell you is when we scope a pouch, when somebody is suffering from pouchitis, it's an angry looking pouch. 
It's just red. It's inflamed. When you touch it, it can bleed very, very easily. So what do I have to tell you about pouchitis? Well, the presentation resembles a GI flu. People will usually call and they'll say, I have a lot of pressure in my abdomen. My BCIR is sounding like a washing machine. It's making a lot more noise. Some people will say, when I insert the catheter, my fecal material, which usually has a sandy grit to it, so I'm going to tell you for the sake of comparison, it resembles a milkshake output. Well, they're going to tell me now it's like iced tea. And we're, at that time, going to need to intervene. They call us. We order an antibiotic. We very rarely scope a um, pouch unless we cannot get the patient into wellness. And I will tell you, knock on wood, we have not lost a BCIR because of pouchitis. And I want to tell you that people lose very little downtime because of pouchitis as long as they react very quickly and they get on an antibiotic. If they don't get on an antibiotic and their stool is very watery, they can potentially get dehydrated. Now, the patients um, are scared of being on antibiotics for a long period of time, and, and we understand that. We're doing more and more with probiotics. We have um, some liquid that they can uh, put in their um, uh, pouch, uh, but some patients, unfortunately, are just going to have to come to grips with it that for the first year, year and a half, we potentially may be cycling them off and on antibiotics. What I can tell you is the incidence or the intensity seems to decrease in time, and most of our patients have pouchitis infrequently. But we do have to get you to that, and it can be rough. These are the antibiotics, Flagyl, Cipro, Omnicef, Zyfaxin. Um, very infrequently do we put people on steroids, but once in a while we have to. And then recurrent pouchitis, we're going to give you a step down and a, a maintenance dose of medications. Again, the symptoms are uh, more noise, just your bowels are hyperactive, uh, stool is thin, you have more gas or more pressure, and you usually need to go to the bathroom more often. We were published uh, many years ago, about 10 years ago. We currently are in the process of um, uh, getting our data together to submit um, for uh, publication. The articles are in the packet that was distributed today at the seminar. The outcomes are also on our website, which is www.bcir.com. And basically, we uh, followed 510 consecutive patients. We actually got uh, private investigators to help us track down our patients because we couldn't assume that no news was good news. And our patients come to us from all over the United States. And basically, what it told us is that 80% of our patients, or 79 Nine percent of our patients have had no problems whatsoever. They haven't returned to the operating room. They haven't returned for hospitalizations. Uh, is 79 percent um, 100 percent defect? Absolutely not, but when you're dealing with the human body, I doubt that you ever will uh, get 100 percent. What the feedback told us is that 6.5% of our patients ultimately lost the BCIR. Numerous reasons, but the two or the one biggest reason is fistula formation. And fistula formation is an abnormal tunnel. So a patient presents himself with um, abnormal drainage. And it usually starts somewhere in the BCIR. And this tunnel doesn't make you sick because it's capsulated inside the body. But the body is a smart organ, a, a smart um, tool, and it wants to get this abnormal drainage out. So it's going to find a weak spot somewhere on your body, such as a previous incision or a previous drain site. So all of a sudden, you're going to see some abnormal drainage, and that is a fistula. We usually have to take the patient back. We try to close it, but sometimes it's not um, success. So we do have a 6.5% failure rate. This bar, this yellow one, 12.5%, that's major surgery. So 12.5% of our patients somewhere in their lifetime have gone back to the operating room. I do want to tell you that somebody that gets a quadruple bypass, 
somewhere in their lifetime is going to go back to the operating room because those um, graphs are not going to be patent. It can be related to the BCIR, but it can be unrelated to the BCIR, such as with a bowel obstruction. A bowel obstruction has nothing to do with the BCIR. The BCIR is functioning, but the body has developed some scar tissue. So that's about 12.5%. Uh, Again, this is on our website in just a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, I've kind of already addressed it. This is Palms of Pasadena Hospital. We're located in St. Pete. Um, I do want to tell you that you are going to be in the hospital a protracted period of time. I am going to show you a calendar in just a couple minutes. But I do want to take the opportunity to brag about this hospital, uh, or specifically not the hospital, but this program. This is like no other program in most hospitals. Um, we have learned a long time ago that if a nurse doesn't keep these tubes patent, the patient's going to suffer because the patient can get pressure and the patient can get a fistula. So what I promise to you is when you're on the unit, you're not going to find an orthopedic nurse who has floated down to take care of you. You're going to find a nurse that has taken a course for six to eight weeks and has worked side by side with a seasoned nurse to be able to recognize and be proactive rather than reactive. Um, it's a 17-bed unit. We've had patients from 44 states. Uh, right now, it's a full unit, and it's like little United Nations. I think everybody from up north really came Came down for better weather because we have Colorado, we have Wisconsin, we have North Carolina, we have Buffalo, New York. Um, so we have a good um, a good round of uh, patients. Uh, this is a room. Once upon a time, they were semi-private rooms. During your stay, they are going to be private rooms. We will allow one person to stay in the room the entire stay with you. Uh, there's wireless internet. There's a big screen TV in the uh, the lounge. There's a washer and dryer. We will um, feed your significant other. This doesn't look like a comfortable bed for uh, for your significant other, but it does become a bed, and we get no complaints. Um, so it'll be the patient and if they want one person during this day. I did mention to you that the hospital is protracted. The reason is most of our patients are coming to us from all over the United States, and we don't want to put them in an airplane and wave goodbye to them without them having a comfort level. So this calendar is going to go on everybody's wall. We're going to give you a little Sharpie pen, and we ask that you cross out the days. So when Dr. Rinke and his nurses come in, while they're talking to you, they're kind of glaring at the calendar so they know where you're at. So rather than the 12 days before for Christmas, it's the 21 days at Palms of Pasadena Hospital. So the average day is about 18 to 21 days. Everybody is admitted the day before surgery. We're going to do a bowel prep. Then we take you to the operating room. Typical time frame in the operating room varies from patient to patient, but it's about four hours on the average. Then there's no rest for the weary. Starting with day number one, you're going to be getting up in the chair, and over the ensuing days, the activity level is going to um, get a little bit more. We do encourage our patients to get dressed, go outside. We will get to the point where you're undoing your catheters and you're just waving goodbye to the patients and we let you be off of suction for 20, uh, 20 minutes. You're not going to be eating during this phase. Day number nine, we introduce a popsicle. And it's quite exciting to watch the popsicle phenomena because the patients are sucking on the popsicle and they get a little discouraged because out comes that red. They are sucking on it and we're sucking it right out of their body. So it's just oral gratification, but they do look for it. The next day, which is day number 10, we're going to introduce them to clear liquids. And if they do well, then we're going to slowly be increasing their diet. By the time they get home, they're eating regular food with two exceptions, two principles. One, if it causes gas, don't eat it for about three months after surgery. So we wouldn't recommend you eating beans, cabbage, broccoli, things that cause gas for at least three months. And then the second thing is, if it has skin, avoid it. You go to a restaurant and you get this little benign uh, mashed potatoes and it's made out of the red potatoes and they don't peel it and you have that red skin, it's going to get caught in the eyelet of the catheter and it's going to stop the flow. That's no big deal if you're only intubating two to three times a day. 
But if you're intubating every two hours, you're going to get tender, and now you have to insert the catheter ten more times. So we're going to tell you those two principles you should follow for the first three months. After that, you can eat anything and everything you want, but the motto is chew, 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 and drink, drink, drink. If you eat some popcorn, drink, drink, drink. If you eat some popcorn, don't eat popcorn like I do. I just whoosh it in. If you eat popcorn, it's one kernel at a time, and then wash it down. So chew, 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 drink, 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 and that's our motto. During this time where you're not going to be taking in a lot of minerals and vitamins, we are going to have this IV solution. It's called hyperalimentation or total parental nutrition. Um, that is going to keep you healthy. We're able to give you fat from it. We're able to give you minerals and vitamins. Um, and we don't see a significant weight loss during this period. We're eventually going to discontinue it once you prove to us that you're taking in adequate nourishment. We have some drains, Penrose drain, a G2, that's all going to be removed. And then this self-intubation, that is what you have to conquer before you can be discharged. We allocate two days for it. We will start that on day number 19. The nurse is going to go in the bathroom with you. If you're a male, two nurses are going to go in the bathroom with you. And we're going to start intubating. Um, and you're going to be intubating every two hours during the waking hours. And then uh, you're going to do that for a week. Then next week, three hours. Then next week, four hours. Fred, we didn't do that with you because you were cool as a cucumber. Okay, good. Um, so self-intubation is what you have to be able to accomplish before your uh, discharge. Uh, we don't use the tube in the nose. If anybody's had surgery and remembers that nasal gastric tube, that tube is pa more painful than um, the surgery itself. There is a picture and she doesn't look too happy. And this is a real patient. And then this is a happy patient. The same tube is in their abdomen. And we're able to clamp it, stick it in their undergarments. They're able to walk around. And once we're sure that they're going to tolerate nutrients, then we can remove it right at the bedside. So it's called a gastric tube. It does replace the nasogastric tube. This is Dr. Rinke. In case his plane was late, we're local, so he's here. Um, but this is just a picture of him a couple of years ago. This is Dr. Pollock. And some of the patients in the audience had Dr. Pollock um, as the surgeon. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away unexpectedly August 5th of 2005. He was on a treadmill and either had a major heart attack or a major cardiac arrhythmia. Um, in honor of Dr. Pollock, I have not been on a treadmill since August of 2005, and I will not do that. Uh, but he was definitely my mentor and uh, miss him dearly. This is just some of our patients, and this is an interesting story. Um, we do allow our patients, as I said, to leave the unit for 20 minutes. And this particular um, group of gals uh, decided to go on a field trip. We have a little uh, bridge outside the hospital, and there is a cafe in a shopping center. And they decided to try to make that within 20 minutes. Uh, it's against policy. We have it all over that you're not allowed to leave uh, campus, but they decided to uh, do it. And we get a phone call. Uh, the lady that owns the cafe called the hospital and also called the police. Um, so this is the police, and the patients are laughing. Uh, we arrive on the scene with a pickup truck because we and a sedan, and we're going to put the pumps in the pickup truck, and we're going to put the patients with their IV fluids in the car, and we're going to hang the IV fluids to that little coat hook. And the patients refuse. They refuse. They said, we walked here, and we will walk back. So we had a police escort. Um, it was quite an ordeal. When they got back, the nurses chain-linked their feet with towels and a uh, $1,000 reward. Um, there, I don't want to ever give you the uh, thought process that it is a sleep-away camp. It's not. It's major, 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 major surgery. But there is a lot of continuity with the nurses, um, and uh, I'm very proud to be affiliated with the BCIR program. The BCIR changed my life in many ways. It gave me some self-confidence that I never thought I would ever have. It made me feel like I could do anything, basically. And I, I actually proved that out by my career, went from being a clerk to being 
a manager of an accounting um, area. So it, it made a huge change that way for me. My BCR set me free. I had also rated colitis for 53 years from the time I was a junior in high school. And at age 70 in October of 2007, I had the BCIR. I have my life back. I don't look for bathrooms any longer. It's given me back the greatest normalcy that I'll ever have. I, uh, I've, I'm free. I've gotten my freedom back now. The BCIR has, has really changed my life. Pretty much before it, I had a brook ileostomy for several years, and I was very um, inhibited. I kept to myself a lot. I was concerned. Uh, the BCIR has more liberated me, where I feel free to explore, to do things I would have never done. Um, it's given me the freedom, I guess, to, to be myself and to live, to live my life the way I wanted to. To learn more about BCIR at Palms of Pasadena Hospital, including many more patient testimonials, frequently asked questions, and upcoming information seminars, visit BCIR.com or call 800-494-7246.